You're listening to the Vocabit Podcast, where I help students improve their vocabulary for the SAT, ACT, and life itself using my unique and research-backed story-based method. On this podcast, I'm sharing the best tips and tricks for a more enriched vocabulary and pain-free test day. Hello, and welcome to episode 73 of the Vocabit Podcast. I'm Erica Abbott, a former English and history teacher, the author of the young adult novel Ahead of Her Time, and the founder of the eponymously named vocabulary company Vocabit. We are mid-mini-series at the moment, talking about remarkable women who you probably didn't learn about in school. Today, we're heading over to the Middle East to talk about Nazik Alabid. The website Rejected Princesses did a whole piece on her, and I am going to be quoting from it pretty heavily this episode because it was so good. I'll link to it in the show notes. But let's start here. Nazik was born in the late 1800s, and from an early age, she basically could not keep her mouth shut when she saw injustice. As a kid growing up in Ottoman-occupied modern-day Iraq, her teachers tended to be Turkish, and there was a fair amount of discrimination against their Arab students. Nazik literally organized a campaign to get every single one of these teachers fired. This ticked everyone off so much that she and her family were asked to leave the city. They were basically forced to go back to Damascus, where they had some roots. Rejected Princesses notes that this was only the first of some four times in her life that she would be exiled, and the article continues, Having now been kicked out of one country for agitation, she decided to try for a second by starting a women's rights club, the first in Syria, as soon as she got back. The club advocated for the right to vote, as well as Syrian independence from the Ottoman Empire. Cue the unamused powers that be kicking her and her family out of Syria. That's exile number two. Well, the Ottoman Empire fell and she headed back to Assyria with a lot of questions on its mind. Newly free after 400 years of being other subjects, Syrians wondered what issues to tackle first. Nazik, now 16, had an answer. Give women the right to vote. Now. Right bleeping now. End quote. Now, in Syria, Nazik faced just as much resistance to women getting the right to vote as the suffragettes did in England or America or anywhere else. Everyone thought they were so clever by calling these women crazy, but that didn't deter Nazik any more than it deterred the Pankhursts. Rejected Princesses continues. Soon suffrage got put to debate. Had it passed, Syria might have given women the vote before the United States. Unfortunately, it didn't, due to the French destroying the government. The French, somewhat incensed at the idea of Syrians governing themselves, decided they owned the place. The Syrian king, realizing that his country was all of four months old and had no real army, surrendered to avoid mass bloodshed. His minister of defense, however, was all, I ain't going down like that. Independent of the king, he scraped together a handful of decrepit weaponry and volunteers for a suicide mission. France had 9,000 well-armed troops. Syria had 1,500 untrained conscripts. One of them was a woman, Nazik, end quote. Then this article goes on to talk about how a picture of this girl, Nazik, in military attire and without a veil, because that was one of the things that she also advocated for. She advocated for the right to choose whether or not women wore the veil. Anyway, this picture of her going off to fight the French was in basically every newspaper at that point. And the Syrian king was so proud of her that even though he had surrendered, he named her an honorary general, the first female general in the Syrian army. Now, the French obviously did crush the Syrians in this battle, but Nazik survived, only to be sent in exile again, because obviously the French didn't want her around at this point. So Nazik moved to Istanbul for a few years. But the French let her come back to Syria if she promised to give up politics. She kind of, sort of, stuck to her promise for a little while, channeling her energy into opening women's rights and humanitarian organizations, which was controversial enough, but not an outright challenge to the French. But eventually she started smuggling food and weapons to anti-French organizations and the French kicked her out again. This time, she moved to Lebanon, where she married a, quote, Beiruti notable, as the book Steel and Silk, Men and Women Who Shaped Syria, 1900 to 2000, refers to him. And Nazik's husband seemed like a really good guy. He was important in the Lebanese government. He campaigned for women's suffrage for years. He helped bankroll Nazik's endeavors. I'm really happy she ended up with a sweetie. And I know I've quoted from this Rejected Princesses article a lot. And again, I'll link to it in the show notes so you can read the whole thing. But they have a great conclusion. They say, by the time she died, she was back home, Syria was a free nation, women were joining the workforce, going out in public alone, and unveiling with abandon. 
A decade later, women began being elected to parliament, regardless of what came later for Syria, for a period it made great strides towards equality, due in no small part to Nazik al -Abid. All right, I hope you enjoyed learning about yet another woman you probably didn't learn about in school. I'll be back next week with a few more. 